All right. Welcome. Welcome. So many uh, bright, smiley, shining faces. Um, although I can't, uh, I don't think anyone has their video on, which is absolutely good. And that is fine. Um, make sure that you are on mute. Oh, well, Bryce is on video. I like it, Bryce. <laughs> You're more than welcome to stay on video. Uh, we, uh, we will be getting started here right away. Um, today is seven surefire ways to sell more faster. So the fun thing about this one was last week I was speaking at HubSpot's annual event inbound and I did a session called the no office sales force uh, which allowed people to understand how are we moving into this idea that yes even in high value sales we're going to be communicating with a lot of people we're going to be able to build huge conversations without ever physically being in front of somebody and then as small business owners mid-sized business owners how do we get to a point where maybe we decide to start hiring people, uh, specifically salespeople, if they don't have an office to go to? Is that even possible? So before I came up with that uh, idea for the topic, this was originally the idea that HubSpot had selected for their session when inbound was supposed to be a live, uh, a live event. Um, they wanted me to present this one. So here's the cool thing is that now you're getting, if you saw me on, Hubs, uh, on Inbound last week, um, you get to see the original Inbound uh, presentation that was originally created for them. Um, they, uh, HubSpot and I are great partners and they typically ask me to present um, brand new concepts, brand new presentations that haven't been seen anywhere. Um, you get the fortunate privilege of being able to see it again. So thank you so much. Yeah, Bryce is giving me an air pump. I love it. <laughs> So welcome, welcome. Seven surefire ways to sell more faster. Um, this one was also created as a, um, a as a uh, as a follow up to our original big one, which was nine fatal errors, uh, which I'm also really proud of. But there was a lot more questions that ultimately came out of it. So. We're going to start off with a true story as we go forward and the chat is open so feel free to to put anything you want in the chat uh Nizi today is our host um you might see her picture on the uh, on the screen there um as we go forward um we will i will save some time for questions um at the very end but feel free to put them in the chat if there's something really pressing she will be the one to stop me and ask those questions as we go forward so let's start off with a true story okay um, this is, uh, there was a marketing agency that had originally started in 2005. So now they're here at their fifth year anniversary. And when they originally came to me, they said, listen, Kim, uh, we've been really fortunate. We've been able to grow our business over the last few times, usually through referrals, a lot of word of mouth. Um, and they didn't really have a, a proper sales strategy, as you would call it. Um, they were really good at SEO. Don't get me wrong. They were amazing at SEO. They were amazing at content generation. But that was about it. Right? That was about as far as they could take it. They could get lots of people to their website. They actually cr created a really significant and sizable newsletter list, but it wasn't like they were seeing that translation from the newsletters and the subscribers into actual sales. And where they were struggling was getting over that $500,000 hump. They, they slowly just dabbled it. It was like they were constantly hitting the roof of it. And they said, we're, we're tired of being at this size. And whether your company's at that $500,000, maybe you're at $5,000, maybe you're at $5 million. Today, I was having a great conversation with a company who was at that $5 million hump. And what they found was that they just couldn't get over that. So they thought, well, maybe the best solution is for us to hire someone. Let's go ahead and hire a brand new salesperson. We're both really busy. It was two co-founders. We're both really busy. If we hired a salesperson, they could go out and do all the sales. They could generate us the conversations and we'll just continue on. But what ended up happening with that salesperson? Well, they ended up getting fired not even three months later because as the cost rose they were paying the salesperson a, a, not a huge base but a, a nominal base their cost rose but the revenue wasn't being converted the salesperson was ultimately experienced enough but they weren't experienced in the sales process that this marketing agency needed for their own business this person knew how to sell in a retail environment they did not know how to sell be invisible. 
They did not know how to sell a $20,000 website. They didn't know how to sell the additional add-on on SEO services, content management, and other pieces that this marketing agency ultimately needed. And so it ended up becoming a wah, wah, flop. Oh, and I know some of you are feeling that pain right now. I know even in my own business, we have felt that pain several times. So I want to tell you a little bit from my experience on what, what it was like to get to that sales background. Sales during difficult times, because let's be honest, I am not going to mince words here, right? Our sales right now and probably going into 2021 is going to be really difficult. And it could be really difficult because we're choosing to make it difficult, or it could be really difficult because we might be searching for the wrong people. But if you're doing the right things, right things right from the start, you're going to find that's going to become a little bit easier. But in, in putting this into perspective, in 2008 and 2009, I was working my very first sales job. I was working for a Xerox. And if you remember in the end of 2008, the Great Recession came upon. I was actually driving to my office and all of a sudden I was listening to the radio and they're like, Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac are now going bankrupt. And the videos were like people literally throwing papers out the windows. And I'm like, oh, it has begun. This is exactly what all the economists were predicting. Yet besides that, and besides I wasn't working in financial services, every single one of my companies that I was working with, my prospects, my clients went and grabbed onto every dollar that they had. They said, we're not parting with any of this money because we don't know when our revenue is going to come back. Therefore, we're not going to invest. And that's difficult. Yet I was still in that year, I was still able to become the number one rep of the year because of how we ended up talking to our clients differently. This was about having them dream and become you know, a visionaries, becoming positive and optimistic about when the future would happen, working our way forward and then bringing ourselves back. I work in a, um, an oil and gas type of city, right? So in 2015, oil and gas prices whew, went down to their lowest. And I would love to say that they were the ultimate lowest, but it turns out that this year it was even lower when they were, they, they were, oil prices were trading at negative dollars, if you can imagine that. But at the time when we went from $100 bar barrels of oil to now $30 barrels of oil in 2015, this was significant because a lot of my clients were oil and gas companies or services or any type of things, but ultimately oil and gas was the big thing, the driver behind these, these um, economy. And so when they all said, we're not spending any more money, yet again, we created solutions for our clients. And this is what I want to inspire you today. Now on the, on the uh, personal side, it was everything from client bankruptcies, companies going broke. Um, maybe the founder had unfortunately passed away. I had that happen once. Um, and companies even going through mass layoffs, whether that was through mergers and acquisitions or just cost cutting controls. And all of a sudden you would call someone up and they would say, oh no, no, sorry, they don't work her anymore. We actually did a complete clean of house. And now we're like down to a team of a third of where we were. All of this is very difficult to navigate through. And when we set our systems up, when we set our sales process up the right way, we can easily move ourselves through it. So for those of you that don't know, um, KO Advantage Group, we're the leading sales process. We build on helping you connect with your clients. We, we help you develop better emotional intelligence because that's actually the secret sauce between closing deals and closing deals really fast fast um, personal experience but as many of our graduates have understood that is like the difference um, and ultimately how do you get those deals for higher dollar values how all else being equal a lot of our clients will come to us because they say if i was ever compared on a spreadsheet i would lose I don't want to be compared on a spreadsheet and I don't want to be constantly like cutting down my, my prices. I don't want you to do that either. So we show you how to get past that conversation, but we really give you three things. We give you more sleep because as business owners, doesn't it feel good to know when you're going to have a deal come through, how much that deal is so that you know what you can invest in, what you can pay, what you can ultimately put your money through. It causes us a ton of stress when we don't know what is going to be in the bank from today to next week. We give you empowerment. 
empowerment to know that the prices that you set are the prices that you're going to own. This is our price, and we are going to wear that with a badge of honor, right? We're going to give you the empowerment to know that the clients you're working with respect that and want to deal with you because of that. And ultimately, we're also going to give you less anxiety. Imagine your business being exactly how you pictured it, this thing that ran, and it worked whether you were actively in it every day or the day when flights start opening up and now you're sitting at a beach in Cancun, sipping on a margarita, and the dollars are still coming through. That's the dream, and that's what I want you to have. Okay, so let's talk about the seven ways that you're gonna to help to sell it more faster. Ultimately, the first one is understanding marketing and sales are not the same. Now, I, I see John Hughes on here. I know he has a marketing agency as well. Connect with him if you want help with your SEO or your other types of marketing conversations. But ultimately, this is what the true story held, was that this company you know, was thinking, well, if we do really good stuff in marketing, if we put out really good stuff in content, in SEO, that should automatically translate into sales. We have a ton of people hitting our website every single month. Why is it not? Because they're not. They're not the same. And how do we know that they're not the same? It actually goes as simply as the income statements that your accountant has you fill out every fiscal year end. Because at the end of the day, whether you're looking at your income statement or you're looking at anyone else's income statement, what does it say? It says sales. It says revenue. It says income. What does that mean? It means the number of transactions. I am exchanging this amount product or service for this amount of money. And as long as I'm doing that, I see it on my income statement. Whereas on the income statement or tip, um, typically what you'll see is marketing is below that. Marketing is known as an expense, but it's also known as retail or promotion, or it might be divided between a few things. Sales is the money coming in. Marketing is the money going out in order to help you generate those sales, but you can have a broken process. If you don't have the, the conversations coming in that are translating in dollars, ultimately what you're doing is you're bleeding, bleeding, bleeding everything out because we need to have that translation. This is like trying to have a conversation with somebody where one person is speaking English and the other one is speaking Arabic. You can't necessarily know what the other person is saying. So what do we do? We use lots of hand gestures. We use lots of vocal tonalities. And all you're thinking is like, this person's really upset. And what they're trying to say is, why don't you understand me? So we want to make sure that that language translates. We have to get tight in our sales cycle. And um, even this morning when I was talking to this gentleman, he's a manufacturer of, of boxes, of, of corrugated cardboard. And what he said was, he's like, you know, here we are. And he's focusing very much on the top of the funnel. He's like, what's the content? What's the emails? What are the, the white papers that we're sending out there? And I said, stop, stop. You're so focused on what the conversations are that you want to have without your clients and you spent no thought into the conversations you want to have with your clients. Yeah, John's like, he's like, they couldn't be more different. So what do we do? If you have not had the conversation with yourself at the very beginning or your team, right? You could do this with your team. You could do this with our team as well. We're going to give you an opportunity to have this conversation with us. You want to start off with the smaller distance to the dollar. What is the shortest distance? So we start off by saying, okay, let's look at how we're going to get the sales and what are the steps that has to happen immediately before the sale happens. In the manufacturing um, example, what they do is they actually, they'll take a deposit and they start to do an implementation and everything. And assuming that that goes really well, um, assuming that the client signs off on it, now they can revenue recognize. And so we say, okay, so now you have that moment where your revenue recognition, before that you have to make sure your customer experience is really good. Before that is now the proposal. And are we proposing for the sake of proposing or are we proposing because we know one is going to lead to the next to the next? Do we know with certainty? Do we know our percentages? Because if it's a proposal, if we have like an 80, 90% proposal to close rate, great, you're doing awesome. But if your proposals are not closing or they're less than a coin flip, 
50-50, maybe less than that. I was working with one company and they had a third, one third. They put a three proposals to get one person to say yes. Imagine if that was a romantic relationship and your parents said to you, listen, you're going to have to save up a lot of money for an engagement ring because chances are you might have to give away three engagement rings before one person says yes. You're probably going to look at yourself and you're like, okay, well, instead of doing that, how do I ensure that if I'm going to put all that time, all that effort, all that energy into it, that I only have to do one? Why would I want to do three? And so we want to look at this way. We then move up and up and up. Because how you're going to measure your success is by your actions. I did a great post on this on LinkedIn yesterday and it got a lot of traction. And I said, you know, instead of looking at the revenue number all the time, yes, that is a great number to look at. What we want to do is we want to watch inside of our CRM, our customer relationship management tool. And whether you're using HubSpot or PipeDrive or um, Infusionsoft kind of has one, honestly, or Keep now they call it. Um, in all honesty, I'm, um, I'm not a personal fan of it, but hey, to each their own. Um, Salesforce, I mean, literally there's thousands. The only CRM you should not be using is an Excel spreadsheet, okay? If you are using an Excel spreadsheet, please send me a message on where you live so I can come over and give you a smack on the head because we do not measure our entire company based on an Excel spreadsheet. There's free tools out there. Go find a free one. Go find a low price one. Um, but you want to calculate your entire sales funnel based on these types of percentages so that we know. Isn't it better to know which activities are converting versus which ones are not converting? If we know that our proposals are converting, great, then we can move ourselves up a step. What are we saying in the meeting or what are we not saying in the meetings that we need to enhance on? How many people are we ultimately getting? Going back to the last step by focusing on everything and saying, okay, if we send a hundred emails out to people and maybe somehow along the ways one of them go, which step was the one that got the client to say, boom, yes, you are the service provider we ultimately want. If you're focusing so much on the top and then trying to figure this out, you'll never figure it out. Whereas if we focus on the smallest steps and then work our way out, now we can actually go in with a microscope and figure out which ones need improvement. So part of this is oh, my notes work okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's you know what actually. You know, I'm now you're gonna make me go on a, a side tangent here. Um, what we actually used to do. Um, it's actually a sample of a card that I had. Um, I actually um, I'm yet to create this, but what we would actually do um, back in my Xerox days was we actually created a um, a grid, um, and it actually was it stood for prospects, meetings proposals, closes. And the idea behind this grid was every week, we would actually go from here to here to here to here. And the idea was you had to have 10 in here, you had to have four in here, you had to have two in here, you had to have one in here. And that was actually back in the Xerox days, like before, um, before uh, CRMs really took off, right? Everyone had a proprietary CRM. That was actually how we measured our, our clients. So yeah, I guess it could, right? But you have to be really on top of that. Um, uh, so, so part of this, if we even go with this example, is that we have to figure out where are we going to find those prospects? Who are those 10 people that we're contacting this week? Who are they? Are we watching that? And if we're not watching the 10 people that are going to move from this corner to, to turn into four people over here, then we have to have a plan. What is the plan in order to achieve that? Whereas if you add on the marketing funnel before that, it could be as many as 20, 50, 100 to get to about 10 people that you're ultimately going to get on the phone and call. And I'm a big believer in phones. Listen, um, if anybody is, is shy of the phone, for whatever reason, I highly recommend you getting on your phone with your prospects today. Everybody is like super chatty and super friendly. So yeah, it must be a full moon thing or something, but do it, do it, do it. Okay, so revenue is then your lagging indicator and meetings are ultimately your leading indicator. The only thing I really want you to be watching every single week is how many meetings do we have? How many meetings do we have? How many meetings do we have? I promise you, if you have enough client meetings booked in your calendar, the revenue is going to happen. 
okay? What you ultimately want to do is you want to measure the things that you have full control of. So this is a typical sales process, um, sales funnel, right? This, these numbers are generically really right for most industries. Now, I don't want you to see this as the rule. This is more of a guideline, um, but start with these numbers, you know? So if you say, you know, these are the number of closed deals we need, how many proposals do we need, right? And using that six slide um, proposal format, we'll do another webinar in the next few weeks on the six slide proposal. I promise you it's gonna <laughs> blow your mind. And you're like, oh, how was that not like, how were we not doing it like that? That was so easy. Why were we overcomplicating the process? Now, meetings. At the end of the day, if it's not in your calendar, it doesn't exist. If it's not in the other person's calendar, it doesn't exist. I can't even tell you the number of times that I would go ahead and book a meeting and then I would forget to include the other person in the meeting invite. And what ends up happening? I'm sitting there, I'm waiting on the Zoom call, I'm ready to call them and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't see it in my calendar, I forgot. What does that do? That delays the entire sales cycle. Make sure it is in both my calendar and your calendar. Meetings exist as long as they're in the calendar. And then finally prospecting. And when you figure out your ideal client, the idea here is that you need to be excited, excited to be able to call them five times a year. And if you're not excited to call this prospect five times a year, get them off your list, right? Or keep them on, like they could be, you could just nurture them slowly. But the moment that they start to want more information or they want to be engaged, you better be excited about this. Okay, your who will tell you your what. And this is really critical for, um, I mean, honestly, this is really critical for anybody. But the first one is if you are brand new to entrepreneurship, what, the first thing I run into a lot of brand new entrepreneurs is like, well, I don't know what I'm going to sell. I don't know what I'm going to provide. And it's like, stop figuring out what it is and figure out who you service. Um, Simon Sinek talked about this. He goes, start with why, right? And he did the, like, we've all seen the Ted talk. And if you haven't seen it, highly recommend, but he says, you know, um, we start with the why, why do you do what you do? And then who do you do that for, right? Who is that person? And then what it is that you give them. Now, I, I don't want to overcomplicate this, but even trying to figure out sometimes the why we do this can sometimes be like very abstract and hard to be able to articulate, but starting with the who, who do you want to service? Why is that important for you, right? Why is like why is small business owners important? Why is the Dallas um, uh, metropolitan really important to you? Why is engineers really important to you? Like what is it about that conversation that you're able to help with bridge? Start with the who, and then whatever the product or service that you're going to be able to provide them will naturally come. And I put something in there and honestly, I should do it as a big red um, slide next time, but I say, sell it first, create it later. And this is ultimately going to help you, not just when you're starting your business, but when you eventually have your product or service created and you're making those adjustments and you're looking for the next big thing, the next big thing. I'm just gonna speak to about this from personal experience because we did the, I did this exercise. I'm part of a peer mentorship group um, where a bunch of small business owner, I say small business owners, but in all else, I'm the smallest of that group. Um, there's people that are, uh, most of people are in that, like that three to $5 million, one company I think that's at 50 million dollars um, and so and then there's little old me right as the baby um, but I'm like okay awesome and so we did this 2021 vision and we're like what is that big idea right what is the new thing that you're going to be releasing and I watched around the room as we were challenged with this question and everybody was like well I'm still trying to figure it out but because I was so clear on who we were working with. And I'm constantly asking them questions. What else do you need? What else are you looking for? What is your challenge? Immediately, boom, I came up with the idea. And in, in this case, the idea is the unicorn factory, which I'm not gonna get into to right now, but the, the idea behind the unicorn factory is really how do we create a repository for you as a small business owner to be able to access salespeople that already have the skill sets that you want. The other who that I asked was, well, what else would my clients need? And we'll talk a little bit more about what else we did to change it. But it was such a dramatic change and it changed the entire business. Because the other thing to remember is as long as your clients love you, as long as you're serving them phenomenally, they will buy whatever you're selling. 
you can have these conversations. And the nice thing is, is that you get to find out more about them as you go along. You can ask them deeper questions. You can find out what else they're looking for. And I, I can tell you the number of times, even just in the last two weeks alone, I'll have a conversation. It's my own sales conversation. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm asking this potential prospect or client, be like, oh, can I ask you some questions about this and this and this? And they're just giving me some information and all that stuff sits in the back of my head. And then the moment I'm ready to release something, poof, I have something. And they're like, wow, that is exactly what I need, right? They love the conversations that we're able to create. Okay, number four, genuine curiosity wins every time. And I, I, funny enough, I was having the same conversation this morning as well with another prospect. And we talked about how humbleness is a skill that we really need to embrace. We need to be willing to admit that we don't have all the answers. And I want you to think about the last time that you were in a sales cycle where the salesperson was telling you all about your business. Listen, this is what you need. This is what you need to be doing different. This is what other companies are doing, right? And they're like wagging their finger at you, right? As if you had just stolen some candy off the shelf. And you're like, oh. Whereas if the person says, well, why? Like, why is it that way, right? How else could we help you, right? How, what are your goals? Why is that important to you? And we ask a ton of questions. We come from a place that we don't know all the answers. And maybe the answer is not what we can tell our clients, but rather how we can collaborate with them and create something unique and individual that ends up becoming a part of our business. When we find out more about our clients through the questions that we ask, ultimately we can help them to achieve what they need. And the, I want to, this ultimately leads into why so many sales cycles fail really quickly is because people are just jumping into a proposal or a demo. This is a scene taken from uh, How I Met Your Mother. Um, it's, it's the naked man, right? And the idea behind the naked man is he's like, well, I don't know if I'm gonna get this, this next date or whatever, so you know what? I'm just gonna show all my goods. And hopefully that's enough to like, you know, either say yes or no. This was the person that says that they're only closing one in three proposals because this guy said that he was closing one in three of the ladies that he was like pulling the naked man stunt. So, you know, I don't want you to jump into the proposal because if you jump into the proposal, you jump into the demo, let me show you what I have to offer you. There's nothing left to show. I've sat on the opposite side as a buyer, right? This year we made a massive investment into our learning management system, big software, you know, conversation. And you wouldn't believe how many first conversations, right? First conversations I had where the company was like, let us show you a demo. Let us show you a demo. And I remember that, like, this is literally the story. I, I had one company, he, he booked me for an hour to show me a demo. And he talked just so much throughout the entire demo. It was a screen share. He was on the call. And finally, I'm like, I just put down my headphones and I walked away. I walked away. And then I came back like 10 minutes later or something after playing with my son or doing something else. He was still talking. He had no idea I had walked away from the demo. Now, as an example, imagine if that was you, right? And I was your client. Do you think you're going to close me? Do you think that demo was valuable for me? It was not. And the only way the demo is going to be valuable to the other person is when we extract the information from what they're ultimately looking for and then turn it back to them. This is what you said was really important. This is the feature that you said that you really needed to help you grow your business. This is what you ultimately needed. And this is about real understanding that we want to sell the cake and not the recipe. I see a lot of business owners that will go ahead and they explain the process to their clients on what they're going to do. They say, this is what we're going to, first we're going to start off by doing an assessment. And then after that assessment, we're going to see the areas that we need to improve upon. And we'll provide you some recommendations on those improvements and we'll be able to do a review for you. And ultimately at the end of this, in about three to six months, you're going to see some type of result or we're going to provide you with new recommendations on how else you can improve your process. <sighs> okay. Why doesn't that close the deal? 
The reason it doesn't close the deal is because the client ends up becoming so confused um, throughout the entire thing that we don't actually see it. So, um, and then hold on, we ha I have a question here. Um, I get people asking me how to show a demo before I've responded or saying anything to them, nor do I even know what to do, what they do when they say any on the demo. I get people asking to show a demo before I have responded or said anything to them, nor do I even know what they want. I mean, honestly, like don't jump into the demo in this case. This is like people asking, can I see the proposal? Can you send me something? The response that we give to them is like, I would love to show you what we have to offer. For I have a few questions for you first in order to ensure that I'm showing you the right things, in order to ensure that this is a right fit first, in order to um, you know, customize that demo so that I'm only showing you the things that matter first. Can we sit down and connect first? Can we? Can I ask you a few questions? Can you meet? Like, can we meet um, to go through what those things are first? Now, if the person isn't going to, isn't willing to sit down with you for a meeting before the demo or the proposal, when are they going to sit down with you for a meeting? Right? What are they ultimately wanting to see from this entire process? Um, yeah, yeah, they're trying, or they're trying to show you, and then they, yeah, exactly, you know, and then if they're like, oh, can I show you a demo? Yeah, it, exactly, right, can I show you a demo? Can I show you a demo? Like, I'm the same way, John. If somebody, I have so many people that will come back to me, and um, especially LinkedIn, they're terrible for this, they'll send you a direct message, and they're like, hey, take a look at my white paper. Hey, take a look at my product. Hey, do you want to book a demo of my product or service? And I'm like, why would I buy that? Right? Like, I, I don't even understand how you're ultimately going to help me, but you're going ahead and just pushing a demo on me. It's like, you know, going ahead, imagine being, you know, a car salesman and be like, hey, do you want to take a test drive of my car? Do you want to take a test drive of my car? If I'm not in the market to buy a new car, what does it matter whether I want to, um, to do it? Yeah, and Bryce has got it right, the shotgun approach, right? <laughs> With the, the, we call it the, the spray and pray approach, right? Oh, I hope something worked. Um, so the selling of the cake before the recipe, and, and, and so imagine if you were going ahead as um, you're going to buy a cake, right? Maybe a wedding cake, right? Wedding cakes are like considered to be really expensive cakes and everything. And imagine going to the bakery and saying, listen, we would love to have this wedding cake for, for our big event and everything. Um, you know, what, what is this going to look like? And instead of telling you like, you know, how, how amazing this cake is going to be as part of your experience and the colors and how it's going to complement everything. The baker went ahead and said, this is awesome. You know, um, we're going to price out your cake for $500 and we're going to put two, uh, two eggs in it, you know, four cups of uh, flour, a couple, um, you know, cups of sugar in there, um, a little bit of vanilla extract. We're going to ice the entire thing. Um, we'll put it in the oven for about three to six hours and it will be not three to six hours. Honestly, that would be a burnt cake, but, but you get the idea. Right. And the person would look at me like, sorry, and I'm paying how much for this cake? Like once you break out the recipe, the person thinks to themselves, well, I could probably just do that myself. And when you think about how you're selling your recipe to your clients, right? This step, this step, this step, this step. Are you selling the recipe or are you selling the cake? Um, and then uh, how do you convince a client who's already has a consultant on contract to consider you? Um, great question, Stephen. I'm going to address that one um, at the end here. Okay. So remember that we're selling the, the idea, we're selling the concept, right? And, and what I sometimes will refer to this as the sale after the sell. What is happening to the client three to six months after they have contracted your services, not the process of getting there. Um, I'll also refer to this as the destination versus transportation. And I don't think I talk about that one particularly in this in, in today's presentation, but the idea behind this is are you selling the, the destination, the, the vacation, or are you selling how people are going to get there? Um, that will be in, I think next week's we'll be addressing that one. Um, agree to something to the highest level, okay? So if you're at the, at the negotiation stage of your, of your sales cycle, the idea here is that you want to help your client agree to some, as long as we're constantly moving forward. If we don't have the next meeting, you get the next meeting booked, right? Always have the next meeting booked and you continue to book to something. Now, as you, um, as you start to get there, um, yes, and I'll get there. Um, as we start to get there, right, um, what we'll ultimately get to is we get to that negotiation, right? You know, now, now I've presented you a proposal, right, or I presented you a solution, and the client's like, well, 
I'm not really sure, right? I'm not really sure if this is the right thing to me. And, and now instead of going down into the nitty gritty and the details, which is typically where the client is going to get to, right? They're going to want to negotiate on price. What we want to do is we want to agree to that highest level. And the highest level is, well, what else can we agree on? If we can't agree on price, what else can we agree on? Can we agree that the solution is the right thing for the client? And they're like, well, I'm, I'm actually not sure if the solution is right, right? You know, we still have to talk about that. Okay, great. Can we agree that, you know, you need to do something for your company? Can we agree that, um, you know, and I've used this in, in our example, right? Can we agree that, you know, having a better sales process for your company, whether you choose to go with us or choose to do it internally or something, is going to help you grow your business. Yeah, I can agree to that, right? So the idea behind agreeing to the highest level is what is the biggest thing that you can agree to? Um, Steve is saying that he's a, a consultant in here. Let me just double check. He's an engineering consultant. So in the case of engineering consultation, instead of having the person, they might not be ready to agree that you're the perfect solution for them, right? They might not be ready to agree that the price point is right, but what can we agree to? Well, what we can agree to is that, um, you know, is, is that, you know, understanding your, having your environmental regulations prepared before before an incident happens is ultimately going to mitigate your risk and help to reduce the cost. Can we agree to that? Well, yeah, we can agree to that. Can we agree that, um, you know, choosing the right engineering consult um, for you based on a specific project is probably better than trying to get one person to do all your projects? Yeah, I could probably agree with that. Okay, so now we're agreeing. The, the idea behind agreeing is that we're entrenching the clients to know that they're ultimately, um, we're ultimately moving forward. This is actually um, Dr. Uh, Robert Cialdini's uh, book, Influence, in having people agree to something which helps to entrench that, uh, you know, if we agree, we're more likely to agree again or more likely to agree again and agree again. We want to agree to make something work. And maybe that's what we agree to. I've used that one too. Can we agree? that we're going to make something work. Can we agree that, that this relationship has already worked this far and that we really want to work together and we're not sure what this will look like yet? Yeah, I can agree to that. Awesome. Whew. Imagine the stress that that will take off of you when the person says, I agree that I want to work with you. Okay, great. So then the pricing and the solution, that's just details, right? We've already, we've been conceptually agreed that there's a deal on the table here. Um, good habits take time and support. Uh, one of my, my personal pet peeves is people that think that sales is a one and done skill set. Tell me in your life when you ever did something for the very first time or learned it for the very first time and felt like that was it, you had it. Even riding a bicycle took us multiple times to be able to get on and figure out our balance and we fell off. And then we would get on and we'd figure it out and then we'd fall off. And it usually took support. There's very few people that says, I learned how to ride a bicycle without anybody working with me or anybody showing me. And sales is no different, right? And we end up having to do, a, like, you know, try it. And, and yeah, there's going to be failures and yeah, there's going to be successes. But the idea is by having that support and that time to be able to develop that habit, you're going to be able to have either yourself or someone else put that microscope on it. Sales is something that is ongoing. And whether we're talking about sales in general, we're talking about any way that we grow our business. I was talking about the peer mentorship group that I have. This is something where we try and we fail and we have these long lists of to-dos, but we have the people around us saying, hey, how, where are you at with that? Hey, how are you doing with that? And I speak from personal experience. One of the best things I ever did for my own business was actually invest in a community of people that were pushing me to grow, pushing me to get better in every single area of my business. And sales is a big one for a lot of companies. At the end of the day, if the sales don't work, nothing does. And so we want to make sure that we have that working the best time. How do you know it's working, right? How do you know it's not working? Well, does your bank account count? reflect the work that you're putting into your business. If you, if you were honest with yourself 
and you took the number of hours you put into your business this month and divided about the amount of, divided it by the amount of money that you generated in your business. Yeah, Bryce. Yeah. You have an expensive hobby, right? Um, you know, if, if you take the number of hours you work and divide it by the amount of money you made this month, are you, are you being, if you're being honest with yourself, are you doing better than minimum wage? Right. Is it feeling easier every single month? Are you feeling like I got this? Like, you know, I'm getting faster at this. I'm getting better at this. Or does it feel like it's constantly a slog, right? You're like, Oh, you know, I have to do this again, again. Are you sleeping better? Can you honestly say that you slept better last night, right? Or even any time this month than you did back in June or July? And are you feeling like this is the dream? Or are you being sarcastic when, when people ask you, how are you doing? And you're like, <laughs> living the dream, right? Or are you honestly living your dream? Because you deserve to have more. Knowing what to do is the first step, right? And I've given you a couple ideas in, in areas that you could take a look at. What I'd love to do is let's dive in a little bit deeper in your specific business. I, I can't blanket this for everybody. I try to, but I know that your business is unique and individual and different. And what you need is going to be different than what Bryce needs, what John needs, what Steve needs. Everyone needs something a little bit different. You're gonna get the steps that right, and your only regret is that you wish you had done it sooner. A couple quotes on here on what, um, what some people have said about us. We've moved ourselves to subscription based, right? We're not a program anymore. You can join us for the entire program or you join us for what you need to. But what I'm asking you for is 20 minutes to understand, even if this is a fit, right? If I can't show you crazy value in 20 minutes, it doesn't matter what the prices are. If I can't show you that in 20 minutes, this is something that you want to explore, okay, at least give that. And why do we give away our time with like this? Because Zig Ziglar is one of the most influential sales leaders that I believe that we should follow. And he says, you can have everything you want in life if you help enough people get what they want. I truly want to help you get what you need. And if you don't believe in me, believe Rob. He says, the longer you wait, that's revenue you're missing out on. Oh, how much more are you throwing away? Uh, if you are just looking for more information, right, go ahead, get the slide deck um, from today, right? We're going to be emailing those um, off to you as well as there's a few other goodies. If you go to kimorleski.com slash ko dash webinars, um, there's information on our sales cycle. There's information on things that you can use just in your business, right? Completely as a gift to you. This is me. Um, I am LinkedIn's most influential sales leader to follow. I am a three-time author with Sell More Faster and Startup Canada's Female Entrepreneur of the Year. And I want to end with this. What is one thing that you will take away from today? Awesome. You can go ahead and throw that in the chat right now. I want to hear from you. What is one thing that you took away from today's presentation? Um, in the meantime, I'm also going to address um, Stephen's question here. Um, he says, how do you convince a client who already has a consultant on contract to consider you. Okay, so whether we're talking, about, so I, I actually purposely left out his, um, his industry because I've heard this one several times, um, you know, whether it's your marketing agency or whether you're anything else. So, so when you want, so here, here's, we used to call it the, um, I mean, it's the kind of the foot in the door approach. Right, uh, one, of my, one of the examples I think of is when I worked for American Express, Right? I mean, of all the credit cards you could have, you could have all sorts of different credit cards. Why would you ever want an American Express? Right? The American Express is the most expensive credit card you could have in your wallet. You pay way more in fees. It's not accepted everywhere. Why would we want it? And the idea that we would go through, and plus, if we already had a credit card system in place for our company, why would we want this? And so how we would do this is we would, we would start off by saying, well, you know, what, are, what are they not providing you? Right? How, like, you know, how are you being serviced by them? And, and would you like to, like, you know, is there ways that we can service, you know, you would love to ideally see yourself serviced better. And by getting the client to answer some of this stuff, we would sometimes be able to, to find out which of the ways that we actually specialize in. But the other thing that we did was we actually started, we, we started off with the 1% rule. 
And the idea behind the 1% rule, and this, is the, um, this was actually stolen from Steve Jobs when they actually originally got into iPhones, was that um, everyone was like, why are you releasing phones? Like phones are so stupid, right? Everybody, the market is saturated. We got Motorola, we got Nokia, like why do we need another phone? And Steve Jobs says, you know, if we got captured 1% of their business, everything would be worth it. Right? If we captured 1% of the market. And so for Steve, what I'd like you to consider is, number one, what does that 1% look like? And could you service 1% of something that they're doing better than anything else? Do they have a very special product? Do they have something that they ultimately need it? The way we did this at American Express was we said, well, what are your executives currently using? We started with the top 1% in the company. What, what's the credit card that your executives are using? And well, the same as everybody else. Oh, don't they deserve to be treated special and different? I mean, who's gonna argue with that? Well, well yeah, of course, awesome. So we, I'm not asking for all the business. I know you're already working with somebody, but I would love to understand what you would look for if you wanted to treat them a little bit different, right? Yeah, Mary, thank you. Sales is really fun. I'm so glad you like that. What I would do, Steve, is I'd be like, what, like, you know, what is, what's the, the top project that you're working on right now? What is the, the very best thing? Or what is, what is the one that you're wanting to win more than anything else? And I would get them to focus on one project. I'm not trying to steal away everything from them. I'm trying to just capture a little bit of the business. Get them to get, allow them to see your, you in action. And then you can slowly get more and more, right? What is the one project that is more important to your company than anything else? Well, it's this project, but we're definitely not ready to like, you know, like split up the roles and everything. I, I'm not, I'm not asking you to, I just want to know why is that one project so important? What does it mean to your company? If you were able to win that bid or you were able to, to put this off successfully, what does success work look like for your company? And, and we would take that information and then we said, you know what? I have a few ideas for you. Um, would you be open to meeting like, you know, just for an hour next week? Uh, um, let me, let me see if there's some ways that uh, we can either, you know, enhance the way that you're approaching this right now with your current provider, or if it makes sense to give special focus with somebody completely different and unique on that special project versus everything else. That's how I would go about it. Um, that's just me, but, um, but yeah. That's how, that's how I would do it. So I hope that definitely helps. Um, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome, Harry. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, any other questions or anything? Uh, you guys have, uh, I have about, you know, 12 minutes here um, left for you. Uh, I know this was a little bit of a shorter webinar. Um, inbound usually only gives me uh, 45 minutes to be able to get through it. So I'm just boom, 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 boom. I forgot uh, how short this one is, but I'm, I'm absolutely here for you. Don't forget to connect with us um, to, to get some more of the materials. We do a new webinar every single week, a brand new topic every single week. I believe next week we're going to be covering the 10 questions you should be asking in every single sales meeting. Uh, Nisi will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the qu 10 questions that you should be asking in every single sales meeting because sales meetings are not what we say and rather about what we ask. Um, yeah, Bryce, we do this as a weekly, um, a weekly event. It's not quite a recurring event, um, but yes, we're doing them every single week. Um, say, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, so you, can, you join us. If you're not following us on our LinkedIn page, um, that's where you'll probably get um, majority of the invites uh, as well as notifications for our brand new events. Um, only a couple times will we have to maybe move up. Yes, yeah, sign me up. You're absolutely welcome. You are signed up, my friend. Uh, we will, you'll get a new email and invite every single week with a brand new topic. Um, good question. What is the LinkedIn page? Um, I believe Nisi will be able to, to grab that and post that in there too. Um, the company is KO Advantage Group. Uh, we're in a branding change right now. Um, and I say that with, uh, with a little bit of my, my eye roll because I think every company at some point in time is in some type of branding change or update. <laughs> and ours is long overdue. Oh my, like you hear the pain in my voice is long overdue. Um, it is. And uh, so KO Advantage Group is the company that is our LinkedIn page. Um, we're, we're, we're actually gonna be launching a brand new um, brand relaunch in January. It's just, it's a really long process to be able to, 
to get there. Yeah, I know, John. John's like, I feel you. I feel you. Um, do you work specifically with marketing agencies or any vertical? Yes, we do, Bryce. We specifically work. So we actually focus on um, four different industries more than anything else. Um, uh, so marketing agencies, HR outsourcing consultants, um, business consultants, right? So usually that is, and so, and I'm going to be a little bit big with that one. We'll come back to that one in a second. And, and you, uh, engineering um, types of companies as well. Um, usually because they're selling, you know, something invisible and they're wanting to get it for a really high price. And, the, and so when I come back to business consultants, um, usually that's like consultation services, but we've worked with a lot of companies as well where they're selling a product but they say the value of our product is not around the product, but rather around our service levels or capabilities to be able to sell our clients. And what they usually describe themselves as um, a lot of our, our ideal clients is they usually describe themselves as more of a boutique, as a, um, you know, as a lot of uh, personalized attention, customized products and services. And um, so when you're in that, that space, you know, that boutique type of space, all else being equal, you know, you want to get people to pay you the premium. So how are we ultimately able to sell it at that premium? So we, we worked with a few different companies that maybe don't fall in, in those other categories, but they'll usually fall in the business consultation type of categories because they say, you know, we are more of a consultant than anything else. Um, awesome. Thank you, Nisi. She posted the, um, the LinkedIn company page. So yes, please. Please don't forget to, um, to connect with us for a 20 minute sales strategy session. Uh, connect with us on our LinkedIn page. And uh, is the training your main business product? Yeah, Bryce, we are. Um, so we do the, it's now a subscription based model. So you can, you join us, um, you know, for as long or as little as you, um, as you like. So we have everything from, you know, a community and, uh, you know, a community and a self-study program to instructor led to entire teams um, as well. And then we're actually expanding a little bit on the higher end, getting into um, entire like recruitment um, sales training process um, associated. Yeah. Recurring products are the best products. Um, I'll tell you um, from, from business owner to business owner um, it gave me a lot of anxiety to move us to a subscription based model uh, because I was like oh my goodness I'm like uh, what if people join us for a month and then they quit and then it's you know that question that people ask like what if you train your employees and then they quit and then you're like well what if we train them and then they stay um, and so that was kind of the conversation I had to have very much internally what if they join us for a month and they quit and it's like well maybe then that's actually a good thing, right? Then they got what they needed and then they left, right? I mean, you know, sometimes we just need a little bit and then we're, we're good to go again. And what if we train them and then they stay and like, you know, we continue on. And, and really what that does is, uh, as the conversation I was having with my team, is it forces us to put the mirror on ourselves and to say, you know, are we servicing our clients, um, our students, our graduates in the very best way? And if we're not, then we're going to see that they're going to quit and we're going to make sure that we're doing everything. Now, I truly believe that we, we service and we, uh, we give people everything what they need, but what it really is, it's more of an open challenge that never ends and saying, how do we do better? How do we do better? How do we do better? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm going to let you go. I see we have, still have a few more people still on there. Um, it doesn't look like there's any further questions, but I look forward to seeing you all again. Oh, no, one question, Jody. She's like, ah, no, don't leave yet. Okay, Jody, Jody. Um, if a potential client is closed off about answering questions, would you say that's sign of the reading? Yes. Yes, Jody, you are absolutely right. Um, it is the, a sign of a longer business struggle in the end. And at the end of the day, what we should be looking at in our prospecting conversations, as well as in our future, uh, our future um, client engagements, is that we should feel like our prospects and our clients are, you know, a relationship that is consistent all the way through. And if the prospect is difficult here, you know, at the prospecting stage when are they going to soften up and be more, more available and more willing to be transparent and open? What happens if they became a client and they had a problem? 
are they going to be resistant or are they going to say, you know, actually say, you know what, like we have a problem or like, you know what, we have an issue or we were really unsatisfied with that. Like, I want my clients to tell me that they were unsatisfied. I don't want them to be resistant and then posting something on Yelp saying, you know, highly not recommend, like they suck. And I'm like, you know, why didn't you come to me first? So I, I see that as a, a big red flag and like, you know, bye bye Felicia, right? I'm out of there. Uh, yeah, you're welcome, Jody. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Stephen. Um, thank you, uh, Dave, Jess, uh, Christy, Marcus, Mary. It was an, a Carol. It was an, um, Dave, Bert. It was an absolute, yeah, ain't nobody got time. You're absolutely right. You know, like, honestly, like, you know what? I, um, I, want, to, I want to surround myself with clients that I absolutely love. And, um, and if, you know, somebody's going to give me resistance at the very beginning, um, all that's going to tell me is that some, probably at some point I'm going to have to fire you as a client. And instead of having to fire you as a client, I'd just rather not go down that path to begin with. So, all right. Thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You know what? You're right, Bryce. Um, especially at the very beginning stages of any company, we will sometimes have to take clients that we're not entirely happy with. Um, I, I speak from personal experience. Uh, and uh, in all honesty, as I continue to grow, I, I just tell my team, I'm like, nobody, like, don't, don't deal with that. Um, one of my, my sales reps was really upset because someone booked in his calendar. He had to like, he's like, something came up. I have to rebook it. He asked me to take over. I said, I can't, like my calendar's too busy. I said, just call him, let him know the situation, like rebook it. And he's like, yeah, okay. So he goes ahead and rebooks the meeting. He's like, he was really nice about it and everything. And then all of a sudden he like, you know, cancels the meeting and like unsubscribes and everything. And he's like, you know, my sales rep calls me up and he's all stressed out. He's like, oh, what do I do? Maybe I really made him mad. And I'm like, honestly, who cares? right? It's one, there's plenty of fish in the sea, right? And if he was really upset that you had a personal um, emergency that came up and you had to postpone the meeting, then maybe he just wasn't a good fit for us because we've all been there, right? We've all been in a situation where, you know, something immediately comes up and we're very, you know, apologetic about it, but it happens, right? You know, are you going to let that one situation ruin a lifetime relationship? And if it does, say la vie, that's, it was meant to be. Awesome. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Go crush it.